Hello, uh, sorry, I don't want to disturb the mic because this will be sitting down and using it. Uh, using it. My name is Mary McAuliffe and I am um, a member of the Smithfield and Stony Batter People's History Project. And I'd like to welcome you to this talk, uh, which we have Liz Gillis has kindly uh, agreed to talk about the Siege of the Four Courts in 1922. And Liz has produced a, numbers, a number of books using images from the period. And of course, images are so evocative. Uh, in a way words can't be. So it's, it's fantastic to have a talk, but using the images as well. And Liz is going to use images from her book, The Fall of Dublin, uh, and talk us through it. Uh, Liz works as a tour guide, of course, in Kilmainham Jail. Uh, and uh, if any of you have taken that, that uh, tour there, you'll know that the guides there are fantastic. And they really bring to life all the long history of Kilmainham, not just during the War of Independence and the Civil War, but throughout the 19th century from the construction of Kilmainham Jail. And Liz is one of their top guides, I would say. I'm, um, you know, um, uh, I've heard from people who've taken her tours that she's fantastic. And from the, um, I work in gender history, she always emphasises the experience of women in the jail as well, which I very much appreciate, uh, and I'm sure lots of people very much appreciate. Um, Today is the uh, first talk we've had after the untimely passing of our good friend uh, Shane McAmosh of Glasnevin Museum. And uh, when Liz finishes her talk and while we're doing the question and answer session, we will be passing around a bucket uh, and any donations you give will be donated in his name to charity today, all the monies. We won't be uh, using that ourselves as our usual collection at all. It will be donated by us in Shane's name to charity. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Liz, and she's going to take off from here. It's about half an hour, and then we'll have questions and answers. Liz. Thanks very much for having me here today. So, um, literally, what the talk will be based on and what I'll focus on is um, just the Battle of the Four Courts in 1922, um, which signalled the beginning of the Civil War. Um, just to give a bit of background information, we have the War of Independence, which began in January 1921, and it officially ended in, oh, sorry, 1919, and it officially ended in 1921 on the 11th of July with the truce. Um, <coughs> between Britain and Ireland. Um, this then led to negotiations between um, the Irish government and the British government and then treaty negotiations began. Now eventually the treaty was signed on the 6th of December 1921 and as we all know the treaty didn't actually give full complete independence which so many people had fought for um, in the preceding years. Um, what it meant for the country was that um, 20, or sorry, of the 32 counties in Ireland, uh, 22, uh, 26, they would become a free state, so it's limited independence for the country. Um, but the six northeastern counties, um, what becomes Northern Ireland, um, which had been in existence the year before, it cemented that border is there, so um, the Northern Ireland state comes into effect and the country is divided. The treaty was brought home, and as we know, it actually split the Republican movement into, into pro-treaty and anti-treaty sides. And there were a lot of heat debates in the Dáil as to the merits of either accepting this treaty and rejecting this treaty. Unfortunately, both sides couldn't agree. They both wanted the same thing as in getting full freedom for the country, but they both had different ways to get it. Um, this image here shows members of the anti-treaty uh, section of the Dáil. Um, we have there Cal Brewer, Eamon de Valera, we have Kathleen Clark and so on. And what they believed was, um, in essence, is that as a unit they were stronger together. And that if they stayed together and continued to fight against British rule, that they could get to republic. In fact, that was never going to happen. Britain was not going to give full independence to this country. Too much was at stake for the British government. Um, we then have the anti-pro-treaty side here, um, and this is of course um, our Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith and so on. And although they weren't happy with the divided country, they believed that it's limited freedom for a lot of the country, and when we're strong, we can get those six counties back, it will take a while. Um, the vote was taken on the issue and the treaty was accepted um, by 64 votes to 57. 
unfortunately you have the anti treatment members, they leave the dog. Um, what happens next over the coming months is negotiations to and fro, um, again, often highly charged debates. And in January, you have a series of events that lead to Britain, the British authorities leaving uh, the country. Now, while you have the politicians being split on the issue, you also have the IRA being split on the issue. Um, at that time, you have a lot of senior members of the IRA. They didn't want, they felt that, sorry, oh, they felt that, um, sorry, okay, so they felt that they were not being represented. So you have in January, um, the senior members, they come together and they issue a, a statement to the, uh, the, the leaders of both the government and the army that um, they need to be represented. They need to have a convention to put forward their issues, their worries about what's going to happen. Um, you have a convention proposed for to take place in February. However, uh, this is delayed because Michael Collins and Richard McKay of the pro-treaty, who were pro-treaty at this time, um, they believe that they need to <coughs> delay the situation and assess the situation. What did happen, however, is um, situation, the situation down in Limerick. You had some early stages of violence happening um, and the government became worried about this. Now, Arthur Griffith, he basically proclaims the convention that's going to take place um, and the IRA leadership then say, OK, um, we're going to go ahead with this regardless. So you have on the 26th of March, um, the IRA convention takes place. Here we have uh, the members of the anti-treaty IRA. Um, they form an executive. Um, it's temporary headquarters staff, basically. Uh, Liam Lynch is elected. You have Ernie O'Malley and so on. And here, amongst these men, we have Florence O'Donoghue. You have Liam D.C., Sean Moyle and Tom Hales. All of these men, senior officers, um, very experienced men. Now, what was beginning to happen at this time, you have um, a division between the politicians and the army. Um, unfortunately, the politicians seem to be pushing um, for action, as in they're making these highly charged speeches. You have a lot of rallies going on, um, and you have the likes of Arthur Griffith thinking civil war is inevitable. If it happens, it's better to get it over now, and it's over, it's done, it's quick. Um, in the meantime, you have Eamon de Valera, and he is actually the famous speech that he makes um, that you may have to wait through Irish blood and so on. Um, they're making these speeches. However, the people who have fought the war, um, they realise that if you go past that line, if you actually venture into the war, there's no going back. And the military men are trying everything to stop this. Now, a lot of people would see the extremists of the civil war would be Cal Brewer and Liam Lynch on one side, and then it's Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy on the other side. However, these men were the ones that were actually trying to stop the civil war happening. Um, Cal Brewer and Liam Lynch, they believed that the people had to have the right to decide on the issue of accepting or rejecting the treaty. Um, this, however, was not believed to be the case <coughs> within members of the anti-treaty IRA. Um, we have Roy O'Connor seen here. Also, we have Liam Mellows, amongst others. And they believed that it was their choice to make and not the people. You then have a split within the IRA, the anti-treaty IRA itself. Um, again, this is all happening between March and April. Um, here we have Cattle Brewer's family. Um, the thing is with Liam Lynch and Cattle Brewer, when the fighting does actually begin, then they become the extremists. They then become the diehards. But until the people decide, um, they feel that they have that right and nothing should stand in that way. Um, you do have, on the 9th of April, the second army convention of the anti-treaty IRA. Um, and they basically repudiate the dial. They set up their own headquarters staff. Um, you then have the divisions between the anti-treaty IRA. They begin to show a little bit more. Um, and here we have, again, uh, Michael Collins, Richard McKay, just to show two of the protagonists of the, um, the pro-treaty side, but again, who are trying to stop civil war from happening. Um, in April, on April the 14th, uh, 1922, 
you have the takeover of the forecourts, just not too far from here. Um, there's a lot of uh, debate as to why the forecourt has taken over. Um, from my research, it was purely a symbol um, of, it was an act to show that basically they could do this. It's an embarrassment to the provisional government who are trying to assert their authority. But also, as Rory O'Connor stated at the time, it was not a sign of a coup. They needed a bigger premises, they needed a bigger headquarters. They'd been stationed in <coughs> Parnell Square and they take over the four courts. They took it over quite easily. Um, Ernie O'Malley gives a great description in his book. Um, here we have an image of the captured armor car, the mutineer. Um, and you would have amongst these groups, uh, this group of men, um, Paddy O'Connor, who's become Paddy O'Brien, who's become the OC of the Four Courts Garrison and the Treaty. Um, and this, although they take over the Four Courts, nothing is done really um, to move them, to remove them. And you have a lot of these photographs taken at this time in early April and um, May before the fighting actually starts. Um, here we have some members of the anti treaty IRA and Four Courts Garrison on top of the Four Courts itself. Um, you can see they have sandbags and so on. And although, when you think of the building that's took over, they didn't prepare. They actually didn't believe that civil war was going to happen. The fight would ever break out. I'll explain a little bit more about that later on though. Um, you do have the British government putting pressure on the provisional government to act, to remove. However, at the time, the government couldn't rely on the loyalty of the National Army, of the new National Army. Um, when the National Army was established, you had to have served <coughs> in the volunteers. You could not be a preacher or a true salier, as they called them. You had to have served either 16 or of independence right through. Um, the thing is, you have men realising either they're on the wrong side, they won't have the stomach to fight against their colleagues, um, and certainly when the Convention of March had been prohibited, a lot of men decide to leave the army. So they haven't got a base, an army that they can actually rely on completely. So Collins and Mulcahy are aware of this, they need to tread carefully. Um, if they act too soon, it could then turn a lot of men onto the other side. They can't risk it. Um, you do then have uh, the anti-treaty IRA. They take over a number of buildings around the city. Um, you have the ballast office. You have Comanum Jail was taken over as well. Um, again, great photographs of uh, Jordan that time, of the guard that's in Comanum Jail. Um, they do eventually leave some of the buildings in May. There's negotiations between the army. They set up like a committee and there's five officers from one side, five officers from the other side and are trying everything they can to avert um, a civil war taking place. Um, you then have events in June. And there is uh, the, there's another convention by the anti-treaty IRA. And this is where the cracks that were beginning to show in April, they really come to fall. Um, you have the executive of the anti-treaty IRA. They put a motion, uh, basically they're voting on whether to let the people, let the elections go ahead that are uh, planned for the 16th of June. Um, you then have Tom Barry who puts his motion forward that uh, basically an issue or an ultimatum should be issued for all British forces that are still within Dublin and um, that they have to leave uh, the country um, and if not they will then be attacked in the hope that it will reunite the, the pro and treaty sides. Um, Lean Lynch and Cattle Brewer um, they don't agree with this. Um, a vote is taken and basically they are defeated, their motion is defeated and the IRA itself, the anti treaty, they then split in two. So you have the IRA executive and then, which would be, I would term it, the anti anti treaty IRA if I wanted better words, um, and then the anti treaty IRA, which are the moderates, which are seen as the extremists as later on. It gets very confusing. <laughs> I tried to explain it to tourists and come in and check. But um, what happens then? Um, they split. So you have one, the anti anti treaty IRA, going to the four courts and locking out um, Liam Lynch and Cal Brew and so on, and they set up a headquarters in the Parents Hotel. This, the pro treaty side, see, is their chance. Because if they can actually keep Liam Lynch and so on away from the IRA executive in the four courts, if fighting happens, it can be over quickly. They can actually neutralise it just to Dublin. Um, Liam Lynch is over the biggest and strongest um, brigade. He's over the 4th Southern Division, hard trained, very highly experienced men. 
And if they believe they can keep them out of the argument, if they keep them out of the fight, then it will just be staying, the fight will stay in Dublin. Um, you then have the assassination of Henry Wilson in June, 22nd of June, 1922, in England. Again, you have a lot of uh, debate as to whether this was carried out in the orders of Michael Collins and so on. Um, there is evidence there. He did issue an order probably a year before. It was never rescinded. Um, with the pogroms that were going on up the north, um, a lot of people felt that Henry Wilson, he was an instigator of this, um, and he was a legitimate target by the IRA. So he is assassinated. Um, the four horse garrison were blamed. Um, they had nothing to do with it. Um, Rory O'Connor, he did say that, but in any way, they are blamed. And the British government then put pressure on the provisional government to act. They need to act. They need to get them out of four courts. Um, they were putting in a plan of operation to act if the provisional government wouldn't. Um, General McCready of the British forces, he realises if they do that, they're going to reunite the IRA and everything. It's too much of a high risk. So they keep putting pressure on the government. However, that decision is taken away from them when the IRA and the treaty kidnapped General Ginger O'Connell. And that's in response to the arrest of Frank Henderson who had uh, been part of the Belfast boycott, he's sent over to uh, commandeer cars and he's arrested by the <coughs> country forces. So Ernie O'Malley um, and a number of men, they kidnapped Ginger O'Connell and they basically say to the government, um, release Henderson and then we release Ginger O'Connell. That wasn't going to happen. So now it's put up to the provisional government and the act. Um, they begin to, the provisional, the pro treaty forces begin to surround the four courts. Um, an ultimatum is issued to the Four Courts Garrison um, that they must unconditionally surrender. Um, no response comes. Now, that initial uh, ultimatum was issued early on the night of the 27th of June. Um, they didn't act because there was a mutiny up in Portobello Barracks. Um, you had one chap, uh, Frank Carney, he's asked to hand over weapons. He realises that it was to a British soldier or someone who had served in the British Army. And he realises they're actually going to use these against our men, our former friends. So they mutiny, they're arrested. So another ultimatum comes, um, 12 o'clock, I think it is. And again, they're not going to move. And then they're told that if they don't unconditionally surrender, there will be an attack. And any loss to life, any damage, it is rests on the, the shoulders of uh, the anti garrison. Now, still unawares, um, the provisional government thought that the division still existed between the IRA executive and the moderates of the anti-treaty IRA, when in fact it had been healed at this time. Um, Liam Lynch had been ousted as chief of staff. Um, Joe McKelvey was replaced um, as that. But then when they reunite, then Liam Lynch is actually reinstated as chief, chief of staff of the anti-treaty IRA forces. Um, he then leaves uh, Dublin. He's on his way to Kingsbridge Station with Liam DC. Again, all these men, um, senior officers, they're arrested and brought to Wellington Barracks. Richard Mulcahy releases the men, thinking that they're not a part of this, they're going to stay out of this. They didn't know that uh, they had been reunited. And he let them go, and Liam Lynch and so on made their way back down to Cork and they reorganised the Southern Division down there. Um, <coughs> The fighting actually begins at 10 past 4 on the morning of 28 June 1922. Um, you have two 18 pounder guns um, trained on the four courts. Um, you have snipers um, in Mikan's Church um, around by Jemison Distillery. Um, also, at that time, the four courts garrison themselves, they hadn't got enough men to actually protect the building enough. Um, they hadn't got enough sandbags, they were using legal tomes, uh, books and so on for that. Um, there was a tunnel that they had prepared that would lead to the Parsons match factory across the road in Church Street as an escape. But they began to dig it and then it was never completed. Um, they hadn't got enough sandbags to build like a bulletproof tunnel leading from the headquarters section, which would be facing the Bridewell, um, to the dome, the central hall uh, in the four courts. And then you have the orderly section, which was section number five, and they were stationed in the records office. Now, there's been a lot of um, debate about, again, the use of these men, because they were all only 17, 16, 18 years old. A lot of them had been members of the FINA, 
and then they go on to treaty. Um, so some of their old rosters would have been roughly 18 years old. Um, a lot of the older men felt they shouldn't be there because they were going to be right in the heart of the firing and it was such a huge area to keep. And that's also the, munition, the munitions factory was in the records office. Um, they're basically surrounded. They had the chance to take over the Four Courts Hotel, which they did, which is literally only 40 yards away from the Four Courts itself and quite close to the records office. But they left it and the Free State Forces moved in, took that over, so they're very, very close um, to the actual fighting. And then you have uh, the building basically get shelled um, from the 18 pounders. Um, th the gunners themselves weren't experienced. Emmett Dalton, who was over uh, overseeing the fighting, um, he had to actually operate one of the guns himself. Um, the actual attack was under the command of Paddy O'Daly, again a veteran of the War of Independence. Um, he had, it was his issue, his ultimatum um, to surrender that was ignored and then he orders, um, you have Tom Ennis seen here with the cane again, he was a member of the 2nd Battalion Dunn Brigade uh, during the War of Independence um, and he leads the attack as well, these are all his supporting officers. You then have here Porrick O'Connor, um, there's actually a great account left if anybody can get the book Sleep Soldier Sleep, it's his actual account of the battle, um, it's from a diary that he wrote at the time. Um, and again, he's a veteran of the War of Independence. He was a member of the Active Service Unit and a member of the 4th Battalion, Dublin Brigade. Um, and he has to try and get into the four course from one side, as does Joe Leonard, again, another veteran of the War of Independence. Um, there was much debate, or has been, it was assumed that there was only two 18-pounder guns uh, trained on the four courts. They were actually given four. Um, one was held in reserve. Now you have two basically fighting or firing shells at the front, to the front of the building and one was always either moving around the back from Green Street um, then to Hammond Lane. Uh, the fork, the guns, or the gun, um, that was stationed in Hammond Lane, they're nearer to the records office and the building just comes under attack, severe attack. Um, you do have a lot of casualties taking place. Um, there are snipers active and both vol IRA volunteers, anti-treaty IRA volunteers and pro-treaty uh, volunteers, um, they are wounded and they are killed. Um, eventually, um, the fight takes place over three days. Eventually, um, oh here we have uh, George Hammond, he was actually lived quite close to the four courts um, and he was visiting his home, he lived in Mary's Lane um, and he was visiting his home and he was shot by a sniper, um, one of the anti-treaty IRA snipers. Um, he was brought to Jervis Street Hospital, as far as I can remember. Um, it took a long time for him to recover from his wounds. Um, but again, he had been a veteran of the war of independence. Um, just to tell you, this is one, well, this is Thomas Wall. And he is one of the men that was in the orderly section. Um, he had been a member of Nafina. Um, he was active in the War of Independence. This photograph was actually taken in Kilmainham Jail in 1921. Um, he was only 17 at that time. Um, when they actually made the breach in the building, which you can actually see here, so the firing is coming from Hammond Lane. Um, this is just one of the breaches that was made. You can see the actual size and damage that was done. Um, what happened was the pro-treaty forces moved in um, and they did... Unfortunately, Thomas Wall and another chap, Sean Cusack, they were actually killed um, in the basement. Um, he was only 18 years old when he was killed. Um, Paul O'Connor, he does leave a description of what happened, um, that they were d digging a tunnel, um, again trying to redig the tunnel, and um, the two of them were shot, um, as I said, only 18 years old. Um, what happens then, um, Simon Donnelly seen here, and he was a member of the Tour Battalion. He was actually captain of C Company, I think, Tour Battalion of the IRA, um, active 1916 War of Independence. And he left a great account of the actual fighting in the Four Courts. Um, some of the stories that I came across, um, they are quite humorous. Um, it's a very, very horrible time in the country's history. But um, amongst all of this, there is some humorous stories. Um, for example, when the firing and the fighting was well underway, um, he had to get a, a lend 
of bullets from Liam Mellows. Um, and Liam Mellows says to him, um, you know, don't use them all because they're going to come right in the end. Um, we've used them against our common enemy. Now this is in the, at the height of the fight. They still don't believe that civil war is going to continue. Um, there was one time um, that a volunteer, an anti-treaty um, IRA man had been wounded in the forecourts and they had to try and bring him from the hospital, which was in the headquarters block, back to the, 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 the dome, or where the central hall under the dome. And uh, the stretcher bearers, two of them, as they were bringing them across, um, they actually came under fire, and with the shock of it, they dropped the stretcher. Um, he then had to, he had been shot in the leg, and he had to run with the stretcher following those two men. <laughs> <laughs> um, another uh, story is um, when they actually, they had the 18-pounder gun, stationed in Little Strand Street, this is at the start of the fight, and again the gunners were inexperienced and um, they aimed the, the, the 18 pounder for the dome of the courts, um, they didn't seem to see the lamppost in front of them, and uh, the 18 pounder <coughs> it just appeared, went straight through to the lamppost and shattered every window um, in the street, but um, they quickly got the 18 pounder gun away and had it stationed somewhere else. Um, but again, as says Simon Donnelly, a great account, you can get that actually in the National Museum, uh, National Library, his account um, of, the fall for, of the Battle of the Four Courts. Um, he was actually over in the headquarters section facing the Broiba. So then we come to um, the 30th of June, and this is when the battle is just about to end. Um, you have the, the court is coming under severe attack, heavy attack. Um, from the pro treaty forces. Um, at half twelve, no, about quarter to twelve that morning, um, a fire broke out in the records office, the headquarters block and the records office. Um, Paddy O'Daly actually rang the fire brigade uh, to tell them that the building was on fire. Now, the fire brigade, uh, the chief, would not send his men, it was too dangerous. Um, until they called a the ceasefire. Paddy O'Day said they're not going to call a ceasefire, the fight is not going to stop. Um, this is where it gets a bit murky because the building actually then goes up. There's an explosion. Records office, it goes up. There's roughly about half twelve. Um, and as we know, thousands upon thousands of documents, historical documents, are destroyed. Um, you have the pro treaty forces that are in there at the time, they're in the records office at the time. Um, Paddy or Patrick O'Connor is actually one of them. He's actually blown up. Um, miraculously, he wasn't injured. And um, again, he gives a great description of that experience. Um, he was blown through a couple of floors, um, but he was luckily um, uninjured. Um, some of the other pro treaty soldiers um, weren't as lucky; they were injured. You then have um, a ceasefire because they're trying to remove the wounded and a hidden feature um, and a very a vital part or a vital cog in the whole revolutionary movement in in the groups that were involved um, is the role of the fire brigade and the ambulances because you have these people that are actually um, active in the IRA themselves or citizen army men and so on they have the freedom to move around the city and they are actually bringing people from the four courts to say um, Barry's Hotel or the block and so on, they could do that freely. So you have men that are stationed in the four courts at force, they are arrested then either in the block or um, somewhere around O'Connell Street um, and that was due to the efforts of the, the fire brigade. Um, you then have another explosion um, shortly after 2 o'clock and that's the big explosion um, with, under the central hall. Um, and again, I couldn't find the evidence myself um, as to what, whether it was deliberately done or was it just through the fight. And I, I couldn't actually find the evidence myself um, to say who it was that actually blew up the four courts. Um, what did happen, and this is where you have the divisions between the executive. Um, Paddy O'Brien is OC of the four courts. He's in charge. So you would think that because he's in charge, he's actually able to do what he wants to do. You have the executive that are in the four courts, and that's Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows, um, there's actually 12 of them, of the 16-man executive, there's 12 of them in the four courts. Anything that Paddy O'Brien wants to do, they actually stepped in and prevented them from doing it. Um, Paddy O'Brien wanted to destroy the records office. 
um, on the 14th of June actually. And he sent Ned Keller over to the building to destroy it, to get the orderlies out, get them back. But as he was making his way over to the building, he's arrested by the poetry troops that had entered the building. Um, he had actually laid mines around the, the central hall in the hope that if they blow them, it creates a breach, they can get out and then make their way down to uh, O'Connell Street and to the block and then join up with Oscar Trainers um, garrison in the Hamlet Hotel and so on. Um, the executive wouldn't let them do that because they saw that it was um, tantamount to abandoning the Republic. So basically everything he tries to do, he's forbidden, he's blocked. Um, he's actually wounded in the explosion and command then passes over to Ernie O'Malley. Um, as you can see from this photograph, there was massive amounts of destruction done um, because of the explosion. Um, Paddy O'Kelly, no, it's not Paddy O'Kelly. Um, there was Paddy O'Kelly actually served in Cable Street um, because they were anti treat IRA where Oscar Trainer was sending men to try to get to the Four Courts garrison and they're making their way to Cable Street. They end up arriving in Jenkins and he gives a great description of when the course actually goes up. But there is another description, I just can't remember the chap um, whose quote was, um, oh, John Hanwright. Um, he gives a great description of when the actual explosion took place. It was like a charging army, that the sound of the, 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 the papers and so on just coming down the street was just like the sound of a charging army. Um, as you can see, there's just one example of the damage done to, to the forecourt. Um, what happened after that, um, the garrison decided they had to surrender. Um, they weren't going to win and they were actually ordered by Oscar Trainer to surrender so that he could actually concentrate his men in the uh, O'Connell Street area to carry on the fight so that he actually orders them to surrender. Uh, reluctantly they do it. You have their, the men destroying their arms. Um, Padre Breslin and Ernie O'Malley oversaw that work. Um, Padre Breslin, who had actually fought in the Four Courts area in 1916, and that's what I found really interesting. The men who were fighting in the Four Courts in 1922, they'd actually, a lot of them served in the Four Courts in 1916, or the North King Street area. Um, Padre Breslin, he sees the men are emotionally, um, they're really, really upset at the fact that they have to surrender. And just before they're being led out, he says to them, um, wipe your eyes, I can see the lines of the tears. So the men march out. Um, Paddy O'Daly, he's there to meet them. Um, you have Tony Lawler as well. He's a member of the pro treaty forces. And they take the surrender. And the men are marched, are lined up outside the courts. And um, then they're marched to Smithfield, um, to Jemison's distillery where they're, they're held. Um, at the time of the entrance made to the records office, um, the orderly section numbered 40, so they are arrested before the explosion takes place. And when they actually surrender at 4 o'clock um, on the 30th of June, the afternoon, um, roughly 140 men were arrested. So the 180 men um, were arrested, and most of them were brought to Mount Joy. Um, an interesting thing, though, um, Patrick O'Connor, um, who I mentioned earlier, here we have Paddy Rigney. Um, Patrick O'Connor and Paddy Rigney were best friends. So you have Patrick O'Connor on the pro-treaty side and Paddy Rigney, as you can see here, he's on the roof of the four courts. Um, he's anti-treaty. Um, they didn't let the civil war affect their friendship. One of the lucky few. Now, Paddy Rigney is amongst the garrison that actually is arrested and he's taken to Jemison. Um, Patrick realises that his friend is there, he sees him. And he decides he has to let him go. He has to try and get him out. Um, so he tells Paddy Rigney that he will make it possible for him to get out. But Paddy Rigney then told a few more people, which included um, Ernie O'Malley, uh, Tom Derrick, Sean Lamass. And these were big names, um, dangerous men that the authorities would not want set free. Um, he made it possible for those men to get out. Um, and even in later life, uh, they were very, their friendship it survived everything. And you have a few of those stories. Um, unfortunately, not enough, but, um, but there were a few. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, then, um, just to tell you, um, sorry, just something else. Um, I mentioned the Cable Street garrison, the garrison Jenkins. Um, here you have Jim Slattery, just here. And uh, he was, again, a member of the 2nd Battalion Dunn Brigade of the IRA, a veteran of the War of Independence. 
Um, you'll notice he's actually hiding his hand there because he lost his hand in the Battle of the Custom House. Um, then he is taken out, or he is in charge of moving to sweep, to clear um, Cable Street off and to treat the IRA. And here we have Paddy Kelly, and he is actually arrested by uh, Jim Slattery, um, Justin Jenkins. Um, they hid their arms. They went back a while later and the arms were still there, so they recovered them after, after a while. Um, and then we come to the, the fall of our, the Battle of the Four Courts. It is over. Now, the actual fight in Dublin itself, it didn't end, as we know. Um, it went on for another five days. So the battle moves from um, Four Courts to the block. Um, again, it's sort of like a reenactment of 1916. Unfortunately, the anti-treaty IRA hold themselves up in buildings, um, and unfortunately, they were like sitting ducks. They didn't take over the right side of O'Connell Street, they took over the east side of O'Connell Street, where they should have taken over the west side, which then would clear the way for them to link up with the Four Courts Garrison. But by taking over the side where the Hammond Hotel is, or was, um, the Free State Force were able to just move in and just cut that link directly. Um, Unfortunately, you do have uh, Cattle Brewer is the commandant of the, uh, the garrison in the block. Um, you also have a lot of people that had fought in the four courts. They did get out and moved to the block. Um, but they come under such heavy fire from the pro-treat force. The 18 pounder guns are moved down. They're based in um, at the bottom of Henry Street. Um, there's armoured cars. Um, and the, the way they attack the, the, the block is there was a lot of thought put into it, certainly with the armoured cars. You have one armoured car coming and they'd fire and then they go so far and then another armoured car would come right behind them. So it's just like a step-by-step -step motion. Um, the anti-treaty IRA had tunnelled through a lot of the buildings linking them all up and the pro-treaty forces were able to clear them. Um, great difficulty and it was very, very dangerous work and a lot of uh, pro-treaty uh, soldiers were killed or wounded doing this. Um, what I find uh, sort of one of the saddest things about the Civil War that is when you look at the people who died, um, the giants of the War of Independence, of the Revolutionary Movement, and here we have Cattle Brewer um, after his death. But if you look at, it's Cattle Brewer, it's Tom Kyo, it's Michael Collins, it's Harry Boland, um, Arthur Griffith, all these people who had survived the War of Independence, um, they were all dead within two or three months of the Civil War happening. Um, Cal Brewer was killed um, while he was fatally injured um, coming out of the block um, when they were called on to surrender. Now he left the garrison go. He told you that the garrison to go there was only a few people in the Cairns amongst them um, and himself. <coughs> um, and he came out of the building um, back at the Granville Hotel and um, he was shot. And the tragedy about that is, is that the Free State soldiers, pro-treaty soldiers, they actually aimed deliberately low, so as not to kill him, but they hit the femoral artery in the leg, and it was severed. Um, Linda Cairns tried to save him, and he was taken to the Matt Hospital, and uh, he was actually shown signs of recovery, but then on the 10th or the 9th um, of, of July, um, he just deteriorated and he died. Um, he was only 48 when he died. Um, and then we have, of course, Michael Collins, um, who was killed in August 1922. Um, the thing is, um, these people, they, they could have, I believe, could have kept a lid on what was a very, very, very explosive situation. But when they were all gone, that, that line is gone with them. And unfortunately, when you're fighting a war, against men who you've helped to create that war. Because remember, the War of Independence is like the first successful guerrilla war using not just the, the physical attacks, it's also intelligence, it's getting the people behind you. Um, so these people create this war, but you're fighting those very same people. And unfortunately, one attacks the other, the other hits back harder, and then it just escalates and escalates and escalates. And unfortunately, to this day, um, the, the effects of the Civil War are still fe felt, um, whether it's personally or it doesn't take much for an argument to, to spring up about the Civil War. Um, but the sad thing is that so many people that had 
spend so much time together, who are so, so close, um, they, they were lost. Um, just sort of to, to, to finish up, um, one thing um, that I, when I was writing the book, um, that really sort of comes to the fore. Um, and when, the best place I think you can go to see the futility of the Civil War is Glass Neville Cemetery. Because they're all buried there. But they're all buried in the same plot of land. It's in the same city. It's in the same country. And they're literally only feet apart. Um, and when people might think when, when the book is when you finish or if you read the book and uh, the the end of it, um, it's like I say, what was it all for? Now people will probably think that I'm saying that question is in what was it all for? Was it for the Republic? Was it for freedom or whatever? What I actually meant by that question is in today's terms, what did they die for? Because in 1922, when these people chose to fight on whatever side it was, they were both fighting for the Republic. They knew they were fighting for the Republic, it's just that they had different ways to get that ideal. Um, they knew what they were fighting for then. They were willing to fight for that, and they were willing to risk marriages, friendships, their families, everything for that belief. But just, would you think, or the question has to be asked, would they actually have done that? if we put it in today's terms on what's happening today. Um, I suppose um, that's really all I can say on this subject. So, um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Liz, um, to explaining the Civil War, actually, probably in one of the best ways I've heard about the anti-anti treaty and the pro-anti treaty, because it is such a complex and emotive issue. And I, I think I can safely say for all of us that you've done a really good job on bringing out the detail in it and how much we need, really need to look at this. I mean, we're doing the decade of commemorations now, but the Civil War is still an issue, as you said at the end, that brings up so much emotion and trauma, and should we still talk about Civil War politics? Um, all these all these decades later.